As someone who's read a lot of vintage genre fiction, it's not uncommon for an author to just drop you into their world and over time introduce characters and context and slowly build their world by metting out different scenarios, sometimes with clever info dumping and sometimes with conversation and sometimes with just having the story progress at what seems a normal pace. And when I started reading Paladin of Souls by um, Lois McMaster Bejeweled. That is exactly what I thought I was getting into when I started reading it. The first couple of pages of the book were a little disconcerting uh, and hard to get into because of the fact that she was just giving you one after another characters with titles and names that didn't really seem <laughs> to have any kind of bearing in how we currently address each other. For example, the main character is, is their real name Royina? Is their real name Ista? And it wasn't until I got a little bit further into the book, not that far, it only took like, you know, the end of the first chapter and then suddenly things started to click for me. But the main character, Royina Ista di Chalian, it is, Royina is her title, Ista is her first name, and Dichalian is the area of this world that she is building is from and whenever you f hear a, a D or a die, you know, uh, Di Guerra, which are some minor characters that are introduced later on, or Di Lutz or Di Arbanos, all of those are areas in this world where they're from. So it would be the same as saying Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon. That is basically the same thing. It's it's basically, this is this person, it's the title, it is this person, and this is the province from they're from. It, it was a much easier for me to enjoy it, and honestly it was very easy for me to enjoy this book, because when this book opens you are introduced to Ista, who is the main character, after the death of her mother, and you discover that Ista is a 40-year-old woman who has grown children, who has a grown child at this point, and after the death of her mother, she doesn't know what to do with her life. She is 40 years old, she doesn't have any children to take care of, she doesn't have any parents to answer to, her husband has also passed at this point, so she is just a grand widow at this point, at 40 years old, <laughs> and she has felt trapped her whole life and is trying to figure out the next stage of her life and she just feels this need to escape and at the at this uh, funeral dinner for the passing of her mother which is a great a great lady she runs away she runs away in all of her court finery and of course doesn't make it very far because she's in velvet slippers and a fine dress and has made a mess of herself and at some point is of course rescued by uh, the, the people of her house. But as she is returning to her great house she encounters a troop of pilgrims that are making a pilgrimage um, for various reasons, whatever their various reasons are, across the land of which they are traveling in this world. And you are introduced to another main character, the Learn de Caban. And then you start to get into the religion of this world, which is an absolutely fascinating combination of Grecian, Roman, or Norse gods gods that are very much interferers into the mortal world. And I just found this absolutely enthralling. Hello, Editing Bob here, because I thought I had done a good job about picking up where my train of thought had left off when I needed to switch my battery camera, which is what happened. But unfortunately, I did not. I missed a section in there uh, that was important. So the religion that uh, Lois McMaster Bejeweled makes in this world is called the Five Gods, and the reason why I'm comparing it to Gretchen, 
Norse and Roman gods is because there is more than one god. And if you know anything about the mythology of any of those three civilizations is that the gods, one, there was more than one, and they all had their own specific realm that they were a part of. For example, you know, Hades was god of the underworld and Thor was god of thunder, that kind of thing. Uh, the same thing with the gods in this world is that each of them have their own, uh, the four main ones have their own season uh, and, you know, the traits of that season as well. And then uh, the fifth god has other stuff. But my reason of comparing it to those gods is because of the fact that the gods in this world are very meddlesome, just like the gods of those civilizations. And also Catholicism, the Catholicism got completely cut out. So Christian Roman Catholicism as well, because there's a lot of rites and gestures and uh, timing. And in addition, there are saints and Miss Moxie really wants you to know she exists for some odd reason during this context <laughs> portion of this video. Um, there, there are rites and passages and these pilgrims are going across and visiting specific holy sites, for example. Um, you know, if you want to go see the, the Vatican and the Pope and see all of those, or go see where a specific saint had their miracle. It's the same kind of thing. And it, it's just a really interesting and masterful blend of... It, to what would be considered completely different types of religion um, rolled into like this interesting fam uh, fantasy religion that 100% makes sense in this world and is so integral to the world that it just, it, it was, I, as, not, as someone who's not a religious person, it was great. But I wanted to add some context as to what I'm talking about because unfortunately a, a whole section got cut out. So this is me adding that section, but I'm gonna give you back now. I think she eventually will get into my lap. There she goes, okay. The religion of the world that she's building is so integral to not only this story, uh, but the previous story in this world because the reason why I was so disoriented uh, at the beginning of the book is because after I read this book, because I enjoyed it so much, I legitimately devoured this book. I normally try to read a little bit before bed, so I would, I started this book at 10 o'clock at night, and then it was suddenly two o'clock in the morning, and I looked at the time and was immediately like, oh no. And then did I, uh, make the same mistake the next day until I finished the book. Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I absolutely did. I absolutely devoured this book and I loved it so much that I went to look up if there were any other books in this series. And yes, there are. There, this is actually the second book set in this world. The first book deals with her daughter, which is the um, leader of um, Chalian, or Chalian. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, I'm so sorry, and is is the queen of the world. And all that book deals with her and Ista, who is the main protagonist of this book, is, you know, her mother and is more of a side character. Maybe just a side, not just a side character, but it's still an important part of the story. But this is basically Ista's story after the events that took place in the first book. And I thought I'd done a really good job in my Nebula War challenge of making sure that I got all the previous books <laughs> from the Nebula Award winner so that way I would have full context when I read the Nebula Award winning book. And I say that telling you with my whole heart that you do not need to read The Curse of Chalion to absolutely love this book. If you are someone who is a fantasy reader, you will love this book. It is, the world building is so rich, and as someone who is coming into this series not having read the first book, the the politics of the world, because there is, there are different regions in this world, as well as religion, and I will say that it wasn't until about 
like the last fifth of the book that I understand that a quintarian and a quatrarian, well, there's one um, kingdom in this world where they're quatrarians instead of quintarians, and quintarians are ones that believe in all five gods, so the gods in this world are the mother, the father, the daughter, the son, and the bastard. And so if you are Quintarians, you believe in the bastard, which is the demon god. And if you're Quatrarian, which is this other kingdom, um, they're, they're Quatrarian. So they only believe the mother, the father, the son, and the daughter. And I guess I have to do this each time or else I'm going to forget one. And again, as someone who's not religious, I just love this. I love the meddling of the gods. I love the fact that the main protagonist is a 40-year-old woman who is in the middle of her life after having achieved all of the things that you know a typical heteronormative relationship is supposed to achieve especially a, a typical you know royal heteronormative relationship is supposed to achieve and she's just trying to figure out what to do and she just goes traveling and has a absolutely massive adventure which i don't want to get too far into but there is <laughs> It's normally just like a nice travel story at the beginning where you, you get introduced to um, Chalian as a whole, as well as you get introduced to the religion, which I thought was really clever, especially as a second book to introduce new readers into this book. Because as I mentioned, you do not need to read The Curse of Chalian to enjoy Paladin of Souls. It is that well done. It is so rare for a sequel of a book or a sequel in a series to be this good, this much of itself to where you don't need anything else. And there is, there's war, <laughs> there's violence, there's intrigue. There, there are other secondary characters that are just as interesting and fascinating as the main character, Ista and there is romance. Also, there is a euphemism for, I don't know how else to say it, cock and balls, that is, that was so delightful <laughs> and so inventive that I had to read it a second time to make sure that that was indeed what she was talking about, that I will definitely use that reference. And I'm not going to say it here just because if you do read this book, I want it to also be a delight for you. But it was so clever and just so interesting. You're too kind. That it was just so clever and so interesting that when she used it, I think she used it two more times in the book, I just, it left a smile on my face because it was just... It was a great euphemism. It's much better than like, you know, your bait and tackle or, you, you know, your eggplant and, and berries. It, it, it was just lovely. I don't know if I should use that word, but it's so well done. And it's been such a long time since I've been so swept up in a book that I have legitimately lost track of time. And I had such a hard time putting the book down. I had to console myself with I'm going to finish this book tomorrow. I'm going to read this book tomorrow. And it's not just that the main character is interesting. There are, it's so, there's not a bunch of extraneous characters. There is, you know, the main handful of characters, but there's a lot of secondary characters you get really attached to. She adds a, a courier, a female courier, which apparently is not common to her party who's young and she is just a, a vibrant fresh air to of course this lady who has had to endure court life for a whole life and her unabashed love of life and freedom in her life which is not normal for women at all especially landed women according to her that it's like could I be around people that laugh like that, that phrasing, it's like I could be someone who is around others that laugh openly and honestly. And I feel like that phrasing in the book just gives you a sense of loneliness and longing of the main character to just 
exist as a person outside of the responsibilities that they've had to have in their life for like 40 years. And as a, as a woman, I know that there are a lot of women that they get to a point after, it's called empty nesting, right? When, when you get to a point in your life where like you've raised the kids and you've done your job and you have all the things that you're supposed to have and you're just like, now what? <laughs> I feel like that's so relatable and to do it in a fantasy setting that is in and of itself interesting. Don't, don't worry. There is a romance in there at some point for her and it's not the initial one that you think she's going to have. Well, I would think that most people think she's going to have and it is just so good and I am so glad I decided to do this Nebula War Channel challenge just because of the fact that it has led me to reading so many books I never would have bothered to pick up before. Although now, now I understand anytime I mention the Nebula War Challenge or I show one of Bejeweled books in a hall, you're like, have you read the Vorka Sagan Saga at all? And I've been like, no, I understand that Falling Free is also a Nebula Award winner and I am now much more excited to read that book after reading Paladin of Souls. Although I do want to find a copy of Curse of Chalion. I do have a hardcover copy now of The Hollowed Hunt, which is the third book that's set in this world. It's not necessarily attached to these, the Curse of Chalion or Paladin of Souls, but I did immediately go to Second and Charles and managed to find a first edition hardcover of that, which was so lucky. But now I understand why everybody keeps asking me if I've read that series and I've been like, no, but I will be reading Falling Free because it's another Nebula Award winner. Uh, especially since, if you did not know, the Vorko Sagan saga is 21 books long. <laughs> it's her space uh, offering, her space, her big space offering. She does do other books as well. Also, if you notice, I have not at one point shown this book <laughs> physically in my hands during this entire review and that is because as soon as I finished the book I gave it to my mom to read <laughs> because she is uh, a voracious reader like myself and she also is retired so she has more time to read but I immediately gave that book to her to read so and and talked it up so hopefully she is going to read it soon but that's how much I enjoyed it if I if I like a book so much that I immediately give it to my mom and think she'll like it I feel like that's probably the highest praise I could give a book <laughs> personally because I love my mommy and I value her opinions and time greatly but thank you guys so much for watching I will hopefully see you in the next video until then <laughs>